Hello everyone, how's it going? My name is uh, Chris Anizik. I have the uh, fun job of uh, you know, running the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is the home of Kubernetes. Um, you know, lo siento, this talk's gonna be in English, not Spanish, so I, forgive me. Uh, hopefully uh, you can understand and follow along. I will try to speak a little bit uh, slower than, uh, than normal. So um, for those that you don't know me, uh, you know, I have a kind of interesting job of uh, creating and running CNCF, but uh, CNCF is also part of the Linux Foundation, so I'm involved with some other efforts there. So I don't know how many people are, you, are familiar with the concept of Docker containers. Uh, I help start and run an organization called the Open Container Initiative, which is a standardization effort to ensure that containers are standardized uh, everywhere. And then I also run developer relations all across the Linux Foundation. In a previous life, had a very weird open source career where you know started my career uh, hacking on Linux, you know, back at IBM days and the JVM. Uh, was at Red Hat for a couple of years back in the day, hacked on Fedora, uh, started my own startup around Eclipse, worked on a lot of Eclipse, so sorry for that for people that had to <laughs> use Eclipse uh, back in the day. Still good for Java, but I'm a VS Code user now. Um, so, and then I, I helped run uh, open source at Twitter, uh, where we developed a lot of the, I think, more earlier uh, container infrastructure technology like Mesos before Docker and, and Kubernetes were really popular, uh, I had a thing. So uh, that's who I am. Uh, that's my background. I'm on Twitter, uh, CRA, if you want to follow me. Um, you know, I'm happy to be at a conference where there's open sources being discussed in Mexico, and kind of in a global uh, setting. You know, I, I don't have to explain this to hopefully many people in this room. I don't know everyone's background, if you're new to open source or, or, or not, but open source is everywhere. You know, if you have an Android or iPhone phone, open source is there. At your home, your TV most likely has open source. It's pretty much uh, all over and pervasive and, you know, you know, to, 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 you know, before I kind of dive into, uh, you know, CNCF and, and Kubernetes is, um, I, I, I want people to understand that, you know, when companies and individuals do open source, it's not necessarily purely for charity. People do it because it actually is better for their business, right? It either helps them innovate faster, uh, and there's actually a lot more research going on out there from, you know, Harvard and, and the World Bank that is actually showing this uh, kind of uh, effect. Uh, so, you know, I, I link some, I'll, I'll share some slides, but this is kind of just a subtle point that, you know, it, it's not just for charity. There's actually a big business behind it, and it is actually better for, for businesses to invest uh, in, in open source. Okay, that's enough of that. So, my life's been crazy the last four years, so before I started, you know, uh, the joke is always like, you know, you know uh, one of my still favorite tweets to this day regarding the container wars, but um, it, a lot has changed in infrastructure land. I feel like the industry is continuing to move and move fa faster. Four years ago, containers were less, you know, less of a thing. Kubernetes was, was not even super popular a few years ago. And, you know, you look at things today, Kubernetes is now supported on every major public-private cloud, and uh, it's, it's, it's hard to... Uh, avoid, but uh, it's been a lot of change. Let's let's put it this way. Um, the CNCF, um, you know, is a non-for-profit that is part of the Linux Foundation. Um, we are just one of many found one of many foundations under Linux Foundation. Uh, we host a lot of what we call cloud-native projects. So, uh, are many of you, I'm sure, familiar with Kubernetes in the room? A little bit? Yes, yes, a little bit. Oh, good. That's much that's much better than last year. So. Uh, when it comes to my talks. Uh, Prometheus is also very popular for monitoring. Yeah, so good. So we have about uh, 42 projects now, which is a good number, 42, uh, all in the CNCF. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's a good number. Uh, we have a bunch of members uh, from all over the industry, usually representing most of the clouds in the world. Uh, also Apple, which is a little bit strange. They don't do much open source things, but uh, big Kubernetes shop, if you would not want to believe uh, uh, believe that. Also one of the largest Envoy deployments in the world, but they don't want to talk about it. Um, but, you know, CNCF is just one part of Linux Foundation. For a lot of people who don't realize, you know, CNCF is just one piece, but, you know, Linux Foundation, we also host letsencrypt.org. Everyone loves free SSL certs. Uh, Hyperledger, I don't like blockchain, but we have blockchain people. Automotive Linux, uh, GraphQL, Node.js, and so on. So it's a very large kind of umbrella um, organization uh, out there. Um, CNCF, like other uh, open source foundations like the Apache Foundation, we have a notion of project maturities, right? So not every project is created equal in terms of how mature it is. And so we kind of have a life cycle uh, we call sandbox, incubating, and, and graduated. So uh, most of our projects 
kind of start out in sandbox, grow a big community, uh, diversify their maintainership to be uh, different companies and so on, and they eventually evolve into a full graduated project. When we essentially say a project is graduated like Kubernetes, it means it's very mature, you could bet your business on, it's not gonna go away anytime soon. And so this is kind of the analogy we use for our, uh, our ecosystem of, of, of projects. So there's kind of the famous uh, business book out there called Crossing the Chasm, kind of quintessential business business school curriculum, but uh, we kind of try to map this analogy to to this. But most most open source organizations or foundations have some type of project life cycle process. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, you know, we've used this picture quite a bit. I, I feel like I need to update it, maybe to include serverless in here somewhere. But you know, uh, the whole industry has evolved over the last 20 years when it comes to how applications are run and packaged. You know, when I started my career, you know, in the in kind of the 90s and you know even before then, you know, you run you ran stuff on big mainframes, right? Like that's kind of the, actually still run on big mainframes, but you know, it was very non-virtualized, you know, uh, there's only a few vendors, very single vendor. Uh, things eventually got virtualized. Uh, AWS somehow came up with this wonderful, you know, rent rent computing business model that has worked out extremely well for them. Uh, Heroku came around and started to do an open, uh, a pass version. Uh, OpenStack Cloud Foundry did an open source pass uh, and uh, IAS type option. And then Docker kind of revolutionized things with spreading the notion of, of consistent packaging via containers over time. And then uh, CNCF came around in 2005 and kind of popularized these techniques uh, um, you know, over time. The coolest thing really about this, in my opinion, is we went from a very like single vendor, you know, closed ecosystem to a multi-vendor open source, you know, collaborative ecosystem across the board here where people have choice. If you want to use Kubernetes, you could choose, you know, maybe OpenShift Red Hat on-prem. You could go, you know, Google Cloud, you know, IBM Cloud. There's all these different options out there and it's a very collaborative uh, project. So this is true. I'll eventually update this includes serverless, but I have some interesting thoughts of, of, of serverless and how it relates to Kubernetes and cloud native. So uh, we provide a lot of resources in our organization. So a lot of people who are new to Kubernetes and cloud native, um, this is a very interesting diagram, but it kind of tries to showcase you what you would take as a typical organization learning about Kubernetes and cloud native technology. A lot of times people just start with containerization, you know, take and containerize my old application or start new there, uh, you know, introduce CI, CD, orchestration, and so on. So this resource is available online for you to kind of play with and go with it and we kind of lead you through this path. We don't expect everyone to follow it, but this is kind of just like a, you can kind of treat it like a tutorial. Like this is kind of an idea uh, to kind of help educate uh, things. Um, we have this crazy landscape. Uh, I know it's, uh, what's interesting is like, Cloud native like distributed system is complicated. It's not simple, right? And there's a lot of moving pieces. So we kind of created this wonderful diagram to kind of showcase our different projects, what the commercial options are, what other open source options are. Uh, we find it useful. It is an open source project, so you can actually contribute. And hey, if you miss something, uh, please please send it. Um, we have a interactive version of this. Um, I've been trying to get it loaded on the Wi-Fi, but it's been slow as slow as hell for me, unfortunately, but if you go to l.cncf.io, you can go filter. So uh, I was gonna go try to filter uh, projects from Mexico if you go filter headquarters location, but I couldn't see, uh, I couldn't get it working, but hopefully maybe we could find something uh, in the future. I don't know if we have any open source projects born in, um, in Mexico. Someone, someone let me know if there is. So if it's not, please add it to landscape. Um, we have uh, a huge end user community. So CNCF's kind of unique where we're structured in a way where we have, you know, vendors and users, maintainers and committers, and they all kind of work together and under this governance structure. And we've built this kind of large thing where we want end user companies like, you know, Apple, you know, Twitter, Ticketmaster, Pinterest to contribute ideas back to the community. Not only use it and not only have vendors, you know, vendors generally want to sell you something. And users, they kind of want to use and improve the technology based on their needs. So we have kind of a large, diverse um, end user uh, community uh, out there. I would love to see some Mexican companies up there eventually, but I don't spend much time here. Uh, we have a cloud native definition um, that we uh, have created of what cloud native means. Uh, I personally don't like this because I can't remember it, uh, uh, but uh, it is something that we've agreed upon within our community. Um, what's also cool about this uh, we have it translated too, so there's a Spanish translation, uh, which, 
Which, yeah, 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 you don't want to hear me spe say Spanish like Las Tecnologias, Cloud Native, and Parada, and it's terrible, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, it was funny, I was showing my, my so my, my wife was uh, born in Mexico City, and she was like, I was like, hey, is this like, you think this is kind of right? And then she said, you could prove me this is wrong. It's like, using Correr, which I think means to run, right? Correr applications. Is that, is that, that doesn't that make sense? There's a, maybe a better word for it? Oh, makes sense? Okay. See, she, she, she was wrong. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. But but we take we take improvements essentially. If you have ideas on how to do this, because sometimes language doesn't always translate uh, across. Uh, <laughs> it's open. I will link the link the slides. But this is kind of um, how we view cloud native technology. Essentially, it's all about building software that is you know scalable, resilient, and and so on. And the CNCF is basically there to help sustain. Uh, the community around this, but if you, have, if you have ideas on how to improve this, please, please, uh, please, please send it my way. So, why is everyone really excited about Kubernetes? <laughs> See it everywhere. Oh my gosh! Uh, I don't know how many people know this, but the the name is actually uh, means kind of um, pilot for a ship or helmsman and ship. It's a Greek uh, word. Um, you know, I didn't really like the name in the beginning because it's just complicated, but it's kind of stuck. It's very unique, which is nice, but that's kind of the translation. But, you know, really kind of when you look at it, why is Kubernetes popular? One, you know, originally these were kind of the reasons of why organizations are adopting it. So when I was at Twitter, um, when we were building our infrastructure, you know, we were traditionally a Ruby on Rails shop, you know, we eventually moved it to JVM. But our problem was when we were essentially deploying our applications, they were very resource inefficient across our data centers. What happened is like, you know, the traditionally old style method is like, you statically partition a set of machines to handle your database, your, your caching, your you know, other bits. And what happens is all those services have different utilization profiles. Sometimes more applications use more memory, some use more disks, some use more CPU. And what happens, you end up with this problem where it's just not well resource utilized, so it's a lot of waste. So at Twitter, we eventually built Mesos to kind of help scale this so it could save us money. If you could actually do 90, 95% more resource utilization versus the traditional data center, which is like, you know, 20%, you know, uh, historically, is that's a lot of waste. So if you could bin pack your applications and use them more efficiently, you're going to save money. Um, also, cloud native generally means that you're deploying applications much faster, so you could either catch bugs, fix things over time, and so on. So these are kind of the historic reasons. I think now the re one of the reasons Kubernetes is very popular is because it's just available on every cloud. So, you know, businesses that don't necessarily want to you know, be inherently locked in or at least feel that they have more choice. It's definitely a more nuanced topic, but it does give people a lot of uh, flexibility. You know, I don't think, you know, for the whole for the whole time in this industry, I don't think we've ever had a technology, you know, outside of maybe like Linux, which is which is everywhere, that now runs on every public private cloud. So, you know, the the analogy I like to tell people is um, you know, Kubernetes is kind of like POSIX. It's like a distributed POSIX that exists everywhere. It's not a perfect analogy, but it is something that's standardized now across uh, across clouds. Um, it's also a very high velocity project. So uh, we pulled these numbers not so long ago. This one I think was just updated for this month. Um, but if you look at in terms of how many changes are coming uh, into the projects versus like commits, Kubernetes is one of the top, you know, generally three projects out there outside of essentially Linux and Chromium, which are moving a little bit faster, but you know it's uh, crazy given that Linux is super old; it's been around forever, used everywhere. Chromium is a little new; it's, ca it's catching up. But Kubernetes is only like about five years old now, so it's kind of crazy how fast things have grown, um, you know, over time. Yeah, quite quite crazy. Um, so a lot of people ask me like, what actually does Kubernetes actually do? Why are the why is there so exciting? Why are people so excited about it? Well. It does abstract away a lot of the resources you would need in, in terms of deploying you know, an application. So you generally are not thinking of static resources. You're thinking of describing your requirements of actually what you need in an application. And you go let Kubernetes, you know, kind of the central scheduler, figure out how to place things and use things. So um, it, it's basically, you know, the saying is you, just, you declare your intentions, your desired state, and then have this fancy constraint solving you know, scheduler actually solve for, for the problem. So um, kind of very exciting in terms of you know, what it does, at least from like computer science perspective. Um, but uh, you know, I think in the future, uh, you know, more people will necessarily not know that they're kind of you know, running on top of Kubernetes or building on top of Kubernetes. It's just going to kind of exist 
below the scenes. It's like Linux. Like how many people here actually contribute to Linux? It's probably a very small majority, but all of you somehow use stuff built on top of it. Same thing's going to happen, I think, at Kubernetes um, in, in, in the future. It's going to be more of an extraction thing. Uh, the other kind of analogy I like to use is like, Kubernetes actually is not that complicated in my opinion, but it's like the same analogy as like Git. Git under the covers is really just like a very simple, you know, it's like a kind of a central distributed hash table with a few types of ob objects, right? Like, you know, blobs and so on. Kubernetes also has, you know, very, uh, you know, a set of kind of primitives, you know, pods, services, namespace deployments that you kind of stitch together something extremely uh, complicated. Like with Git, it's a very kind of simple store. You know, if you look at the porcelain commands in Git, you know, even with like simple artifacts, you could build very complex things. And I think that's kind of what you're seeing um, with Kubernetes. It's not the best analogy, but I think it kind of works for me because you know, Git is fairly simple under the covers and Kubernetes also, I think has very simple primitives uh, un un uh, underneath itself. Um, Features, why do people like it? Uh, anytime you start building large distributed systems and applications, uh, you come across like, you know, what happens if you have to, you know, uh, deal with a, a hardware failure, hard drives die, you know, every, everything, you know, essentially fails uh, over time. Um, how do you roll things back? Uh, you know, how do you, uh, you know, deal with storage, scaling and so on. Kubernetes has basically baked a lot of these, you know, hard lessons that were learned from a lot of the internet scale companies out there like Google and so on of how to do this properly. Anytime you build, you know, an application that needs to scale, you're going to have, you're going to run into these problems and it, they're not generally easy, but Kubernetes arms you with the primitives and tools to kind of help you um, uh, get there essentially. Uh, so, um, you know, I generally don't recommend, you know, if you're just writing an application to start, uh, I wouldn't pretend Kubernetes don't exist and just write your application. Once you get to a point where you actually want to go scale it and, and so on, you may want to start deploying um, on Kubernetes in, in the long term. Um, a lot of people ask, how does Kubernetes get developed? It's a fairly large project that moves very fast. Well, it's a very kind of, I, I consider it one of the most kind of open communities out there. Um, you know, if you ever wanted to contribute to Kubernetes, uh, they uh, actively participate in programs like Summer of Code, Outreachy, Community Bridge, and so on. But um, it's such a big, you know, complicated uh, project where it's kind of like the Linux kernel. There's very different parts of it, right? There's maybe some people that explicitly work on like the USB bits or something, right? Kubernetes is similar where it's split up in essentially these things called mostly special interest groups. So if you're very like interested in like the CLI, right, you would go contribute to the SIG CLI, or if you're a UI person, there's SIG UI. So it's kind of broken apart by different specialized interest groups where you go contribute um, to, to, to the code base. Windows, maybe Windows is your jam. Um, so it's all definitely um, you know, fairly uh, open in how it's organized and structured. And each of these, each of these groups generally have a, at least a GitHub repo, uh, a set of projects involved with it, uh, and like weekly community meetings that you could jump in and get involved. So um, if you have any questions on like a particular area of getting involved, I'm more than happy to kind of point you to the right direction because we're always loving to get more contributors uh, in, 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 in this space. Uh, this is always fun. So like, how do you learn Kubernetes? Um, so there's generally, yeah, just generally two recommendations that I, I recommend. Uh, I think the simplest thing is a lot of people generally have experience with containers before they play with Kubernetes. So if you have um, Docker has a beautiful kind of Mac client and uh, essentially Docker Enterprise or uh, Docker for Mac OS, sorry, that uh, within Docker for Mac OS, it actually has Kubernetes embedded in it, which is kind of like probably the simplest way, I think, for you to kind of get started because you don't have to install it. Um, and you can kind of play with a local machine. Um, the other option is you could actually definitely use a managed service, you know, GKE, uh, EKS from the different cloud providers, but I generally recommend people to use the uh, built-in version. Like if you have Docker, uh, you've kind of have Docker up here, there's kind of like a little setting, uh, where is it? Da, 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 da. So like there's Kubernetes and you could just, you know, have it launched and, you know, it's not enabled by default, but if you go to, do, 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 if you go preferences, there's this wonderful Kubernetes things and you like enable Kubernetes and it'll basically go run it behind the scenes, install it and you're good to go. Probably the easiest way in my opinion to kind of get uh, started with it uh, to kind of play with um, uh, locally. There are some other projects that are making this a little bit easier. There's something called Kind, but it's a little bit, you know, a little bit more, uh, it takes a little more time to I think get started and install it. So I generally recommend 
people to do that. Um, there's also a bunch of tutorials um, out there that you could use. And you know, like I mentioned before, uh, last time I counted, there's something like 80, 90 Kubernetes certified offerings from clouds or you know, Rancher, or OpenShift, yada, yada. Um, training certification. So we have um, an introduction to Kubernetes course on edX. It's free. It teaches you the straight up basics of you know, the different concepts of like a service, a pod, a deployment. Um, it's not translated into Spanish. I apologize. Well, I'll probably start working on that. Uh, we also have a Kubernetes fundamental course, which about 800 people have taken. Uh, and then we have kind of a certifi certification program. So if you're familiar with like um, RHCE, like Red Hat certified and all this, it's a very similar concept. Um, you know, we basically map it to a quarterly Kubernetes release. Um, it's kind of a fun proctored exam, so it's kind of a little bit, you know, I don't want to say creepy, but it's like, a, you know, you, you know, you, you take it, you have a command line prompt, and someone's watching you, right? So you're not cheating. They want to make sure you know, you're not you're not cheating. It's actually a little bit challenging. I uh, and we have two different ex we have two different flavors. One is for CKA, which is uh, like your uh, sysadmin or SRE essentially, and then CKAD which is meant for, uh, I don't care where, how Kubernetes is installed or deployed, I'm more of an app developer and I have like a node application or something and I kind of want to interface with the Kubernetes thing. I don't really care how etcd is deployed and run. So two different flavors. Um, we've had thousands of people uh, have taken it. Um, I still think to this day we've, I'll have to check the numbers, but um, I think it's about four or 500 people that have passed the um, CKA. Uh, and then um, a little bit less for the CKAD since it's a little bit newer. So it is a fairly tough, uh, you know, pass rate's not so good on, on the exam. It's tough, but you're able to retake it. Um, uh, I think you retake it once in a year. Um, KCSP, uh, this is what I mentioned. So this is like um, for certain companies out there, uh, you know, say you're a business, I don't know, like, uh, you know, the Banco Mare or something, and you're like, hey, I want to hire a company to go help me learn how to deal with Kubernetes, um, we have an official uh, program that essentially vets companies out there that you could use. Um, you know, uh, that essentially what we do is, you know, they have certified engineers um, that are available. You know, they're a CNCF member and they need to have at least a business model that supports this so a company could have an idea that they're not gonna go uh, away. So we have a lot of them now. I just, there's uh, too many logos. Yay, logos, people love Kubernetes. Um, conferences. So. Um, I'm, a couple things I'm excited about. Uh, we have KubeCon coming up in San Diego. So if you actually really kind of want to be introduced to the community, um, I think KubeCon's a, a great place to do that. Uh, it's going to be in San Diego. Um, we're going to have uh, 10 to 12,000 people there, which is, is a very large number. It makes it, it literally makes it probably the largest open source conference in the world, which is a little bit scary in some ways. But um, there will be tutorials, great talks, the schedule's posted. Um, if you're interested in attending or will be there, please let me know. We're happy to offer people uh, discounts that attend this conference too. So uh, next year, we'll be doing it in Europe, in Amsterdam, China, Shanghai, and uh, we'll be back in uh, Boston in, in North America. The thing that I'm personally excited about is we're starting Kubernetes Forum. So uh, there are much more smaller events, but we're going to do our first Kubernetes event in Mexico City next year. We haven't finalized the date but it's most likely going to be in February of next year. So it will be in CDMX. I'm trying to pick the venue. I don't know, like it's, it's a little bit challenging when you do an event the first time, you never know how many people show up. So it's a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit difficult, but we'll be doing these Kubernetes forums all over the world uh, to try to bring um, you know, a mix of local speakers and international speakers in, in kind of one, uh, one place. So. What's up? Uh, potentially. So uh, we're still. Uh, we did Mexico City first. It's it's it. Yeah. For me, it's like it's a little bit selfish because I have family there, so it's easy for me to 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 uh, two, two birds, one stone. So yeah, so it makes sense. So, but Guadalajara is in list. I, I, I for me, it's it's always hard to judge where kind of the tech centers of, of countries are sometimes. But Guadalajara definitely on 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 the list. Um, so the other thing I kind of want to end it with is like just basic. Um, you know, a lot of people when I attend, they're like, hey, can, how can I, like, I, I didn't know the attendance of this conference of whether there were people that were domain experts or there were people more new to open source. So here are some kind of basic tips, tricks you kind of learn um, through, through your things. So 
The other thing I wanted to point out is um, the Linux Foundation for every event, whether it's KubeCon, uh, Open Source Summit, uh, Auto Linux, we do a bunch of the KVM forum for those KVM diehards in the room. Uh, all of our events have uh, diversity and needs-based scholarships. So depending on your background and so on, you could definitely take advantage of this. Um, you know, everywhere I go, like, you know, we, we, we try to do our best to ensure that our events bring more people all over the world too. So please, like, especially if you're new to open source, um, you know, I think, you know, when I started my career, I think I, 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 you know, I went to school in Massachusetts and I went to like, I think it was like a Linux con in like 98 or something. And that's kind of how I get to met the community there and, and all and so on. And I think events are a great way to really get involved, especially, you know, help me lead to my first job, which I'm still thankful to say. So just wanted to let you know that that's an option and available uh, for everyone. Thank you. Um, if you're completely new to open source, which some of you may not be, um, we have free kind of training of like uh, a couple things around open source, like how to use Git, how to do pull requests, uh, what the heck are open source licenses, and so on. So uh, those are freely available um, that you're able to, to take. Um, also for attendees here, for any of our courses that are like any certification, any um, uh, training that has a cost with it, uh, there's a 50% little coupon here that you could use. So uh, I'm happy to you know share that with folks if you're like want to do if you want your if you want to try your hand at certified Kubernetes, go for it. Be a little bit cheaper. Uh, yeah, yeah. Woo, exactly. Um, uh, if, yeah, if you're a Kubernetes contributor, come to me. I'll, I'll give it. I'll give you it for free. Um, but uh, the other kind of thing, um, you know, there, there was a question on the panel earlier. I, I think it was like uh, someone was asking. I think is like you know what can you do to make sure you're like your open source project is like successful or something, right? And kind of slipped my mind, but we have this thing called, um, uh, it's part of the Linux Foundation, we call it the Core Infrastructure Best, Practicing Pro Best Practices Badges Program, I guess it's a terrible name, but um, well, essentially what it is is you can kind of think of like a checklist. I don't know, um, it, you know how many out there people have read this, there's this book called uh, like the Checklist Manifesto where like, you know, doctors and other people like, you know, in a surgery operating room, they actually have this checklist that they go through to ensure that maybe they don't leave like a scalpel in someone, right? So similar concept where, uh, <laughs> similar concept for an open source project, you consider this kind of like a checklist of, you know, you should have potentially like a mailing list so people could ask questions. You could have a, you should have a security disclosure process. You should have a, you know, uh, a way for uh, people to report, you know, certain types of issues. So. Um, we recommend projects kind of go through this because it kind of makes sure that your project is set up for kind of success based on uh, the uh, expert opinions of, of some like ex esteemed open source leaders out there. So it's kind of a fun project. It's an automated fun little checklist that you go through. Um, there you go. Uh, open source guides. So one of my big passions in life is teaching uh, companies out there of how to be good open source citizens and contributing back because you know, I think the I think the open source sustainability problem is solved by uh, teaching companies that it's it's okay to consume. Like everyone's going to use open source, we already see it, but it's very important to contribute back. So there's a lot of good guides of like you know how to start an open source project, how to kill or archive one if things don't go work out, and and so on. So there's these free guides out there that you kind of learn from, and they're on GitHub too, that you could um, uh, point to. There's other uh, you know, uh, resources out there that you could use. Um, if you're getting new to Kubernetes, our Slack community is fantastic. I think we have, we probably, we definitely have the largest open source Slack out there. I think it's like 50, 60,000 people now, which is a lot. Um, yeah, I think there's only a couple other companies that have bigger, bigger Slacks. Uh, I think IBM, IBM has a ginormous Slack. Uh, but um, it's a great place to kind of get started um, and there's different channels for, uh, for your interests. Um, we're friendly, so CNCF, we're about 30 people, um, you know, part of the uh, community. We have employees that help our projects with marketing, you know, events, technical writing. Uh, you know, feel free to say hi to any of us. You know, I'm here, feel free to talk to me. Uh, it's kind of a fun little organization, um, you know, uh, that we have. Uh, I'm personally proud that we've tried really hard to kind of build a diverse team. So like CNCF staff-wise is about 65% women, which is like, almost unheard of um, when it comes to, to open source. So feel free to say, say hi to us when, when we're around. Um, and that's basically it. So I think I'll have about five minutes for questions. You could follow me on uh, Twitter. You know, I love and hate the service at the same time. Uh, 
I have a website, and then you could always email me at cra at linuxfoundation.org. Uh, so I'm happy to like talk any details around Kubernetes or projects that I'm familiar with. You know, I've Envoy GRPC, but um, feel free to ask me any questions if you want. And I think we have about 